who's going to make a brief comment um, is Mike Feinstein, who is a city councilman in Santa Monica, former mayor. <laughs> Um, I want to show you a poster here. I just came back. I was one of about uh, 10 U.S. Greens who was at the founding of the European Green Party. And we are all familiar that we've had Green Parties in Europe for many years. They just took the parties across the continent because they have the European Parliament elections in June. There's both the 15 existing EU countries and then the 10 new countries from the East and the South that are joining the EU. And what we're doing now in Europe is actually going to have not only a common platform across 25 countries, but people are going to be campaigning across national borders, sharing resources, etc. It's the first party that's doing that and trying to promote integration along solidarity, economic justice, environmental sustainability, those sort of things, and making a party um, across borders to do that sort of thing is what the, what the Europeans are, are, are doing. It was very exciting, and there were not only people there from uh, the United States, but from all over the planet, which is a um, kind of another marker about how we're a global movement. We're, as a political party, as an electoral force, we're in over 90 countries around the world. And what that says is that there's something very endemic in terms of a green response to the unsustainability of our lifestyle as a species across cultural lines. We have cultural challenges in individual countries, uh, our own different political systems and how we develop, but there's something that's even deeper. It's not just a national response, but it's something that is planetary-wide. It's critical, of course, to have a planetary-wide approach because a lot of our issues are planetary-wide and a lot of the forces that are behind some of the problems we have for example, some of the multinational transnationals are global in nature. So really, on a global level, we're probably the best electoral hope to complement those movements, like we saw in Cancun or Seattle or Genoa, etc. Um, so it, it's very exciting. Just in houses like this, it's happening all over the planet. And I was one of the people who was fortunate in the 1980s to be at some of those early founding meetings. And we struggled with whether or not we could be part of the electoral system, keep our values, and still be effective. And in the early years, we were really afraid to run anybody for office. If we did that, it would corrupt ourselves. We wouldn't be able to hold it. We'd be part of the system. We'd lose our vision, etc. And we moved very slowly. But over the years, I think what we found is that we can participate in the system, keep the long-term vision, and be productive incrementally on a day-to-day -day basis. There were there was really nobody who was famous, big, wealthy, or anything else when the party was started. But we kind of went with the belief system that if we had a platform, we stood for it, we did the right thing, that we would attract people of talent over the years. And that has borne out the diversity of the party has increased, the talent level of the party has increased, the notoriety um, has increased uh, before uh, Ralph Nader was on the Donahue show in February of 1996, we didn't have five cumulative minutes of being mentioned on national TV in our entire history. Now, you know, grade school kids, when they're asked about which political <coughs> parties and what they're interested in, part of that um, is the Green Party, and people are conscious of it. That's a, a massive shift in a very short time in a country that is not friendly to alternative viewpoints. Yeah. How it relates to our, our presentation today is one of the things that we hope that would happen in our evolution is that we would attract people of talent by doing the right thing. And we are so blessed that somebody like Matt, who, you know, he wasn't a Green originally, he was just out there doing the good stuff that kind of was in sync with our platform, he ended up self-identifying as a Green in 2000 because he had seen the differences between our candidates, uh, in particular Medea Benjamin in California, our U.S. Senate candidate again, candidate against Diane Feinstein, who, while she shares a last name with me, doesn't uh, <laughs> <laughs> share a lot of politics. Um, so it was a case where Max, seeing the good stuff there, just self-identified. And then he had the guts, because in San Francisco they have a runoff where city council individual district races, uh, rather than just a winner-take-all with ten candidates for one seat, right away it narrows to two, and then they go to a runoff. And Matt made the runoff and he had decided to register as a Green. And a lot of people had counseled him at the time, look, you're a Democrat right now, there's two Democrats in the race, go ahead and win, 
you can re-register green later, and it'll be fine. Uh, nobody's going to really come down to you that hard, but at least you'll be able to win the seat. And then once you're in, you can become a green and change the system. And it's not so bad to be a Trojan horse like that. Well, Matt not only was open about the change, but he did an op-ed in the Bay Guardian about why he did that, because he believed in terms of transparency and openness in government that it works the best that way. And he believed that the voters needed to see what he was really about, and if they were going to pick him, they were going to pick him on the basis of who he was. And part of his identity at that point had been a change in his political affiliation. Mm. Well, not only was it successful, but it was wildly successful. He won with 66% of the vote, and this was playing out during the debacle in Florida during the month of November of 2000 until the beginning of December 2000, and they actually did hit pieces on him, saying, doesn't Mac Gonzalez understand what's happening in Florida? And you know, they tried to paint him with all that stuff, and nevertheless, he won with, with two-thirds of the vote, which really speaks to not only, I think, the efficacy and value of our platform as a Green Party, but the fact that people respect honesty in politics. And if you simply do that sort of thing, there's a lot of avenue for success. And Matt, I think, is here today to share some of that success. I'm really proud that he's part of our movement. And with that, I wanted to introduce you, Matt Gonzalez. <laughs> got into my uh, first political race in 1999. I had been working as a public defender for many years, and I got into a race for district attorney. And there's a fellow who writes for the San Francisco Chronicle. He's a very conservative writer who likes to prop up all the wrong people and all the wrong things. His name's Ken Garcia. And at the time I was running, he said something about me. He thought it was an insult, but I took it um, as a compliment. He said that in another era, I would have been in the socialist circle of Eugene Depp. <laughs> <laughs> and I just remember it because I sort of feel that Debsy circle would have been something like this. What I, I feel is a community that Kevin and Linda have really put together. There are a lot of really great progressives here, and I haven't, uh, in many years, been in a place where so many people were talking good politics at a level of discourse that you know you generally just don't get to hear. So thanks for creating uh, Eugene Dawson's <laughs> um, I think that what we tried to do in the last mayor's race in San Francisco is extraordinary for its sheer simplicity. Um, you know, I got into the political race and basically um, tried to tell the truth and tried to run an ethical campaign. And we worked off of the assumption that San Francisco was fundamentally a progressive city. We rejected the idea that once you get into a runoff, you're supposed to moderate your views and water them down so that you can appeal to the middle. And we did the opposite. We said, look, here we are. Here is where we stand on the progressive issues. We believe in these ideas because we think they're the right ones. We think our ideas are better. And rather than sell them short, let's go out and try to persuade people that we're right. And uh, let's just tell people the way it is. In the course of that campaign, it meant that we took some pretty good progressive uh, positions on everything from you know, promoting renewable energy, tidal energy, solar energy, to talking about progressive taxation, uh, to even opposing uh, extremely popular measure related to funding for the public schools. Uh, opposition based on the fact that it was essentially an election time measure that was being brought to the voters to make a particular candidate popular, when the truth was no monies had been identified for this measure. Uh, there was no revenue source, and so we were saying, well, this money, you know, to come up with this money, it's going to have to compete with public health and public safety and all these other things, and that's not a responsible way to do government. Let's identify the money, and then let's dedicate it to the schools. The, um, I got into the race and, you know, did not have very wide support, quite frankly. Um, I had one of my colleagues on the Board of Supervisors uh, a very progressive Democrat named Chris Daly who endorsed me. And I was endorsed by um, really just a couple of newspapers. I was endorsed by the 
preeminent African American newspaper, uh, the Bayview newspaper, Willie and Mary Ratcliffe run out of the Bayview. I was endorsed by uh, a socialist newspaper that publishes infrequently uh, called Frontlines, and I was endorsed by an online journal called the San Francisco Sentinel. Um, this is hardly the kind of support that somebody that makes it into a runoff generally has. And so I think that what happened was a, a, an immediate shock, the idea that a green with uh, a city with 3% registered green could garner 19% of the vote and land into a runoff. And um, it was something that we were not altogether prepared for. We had, uh, I had gotten into the race relatively late uh, on the day of the filing deadline. We ran a campaign for less than 100 days. We raised and spent the least of the six major candidates, um, you know, $150,000. And there we were the next day after the runoff with no money in the bank trying to figure out how we were going to mount uh, and finish off this campaign. It was complicated by the fact that the Democrats were really circling the wagon. And it's interesting that when they criticize our presidential candidates like Ralph Nader and others, they often say, oh, you have to start locally. Forget this national <laughs> stuff. And here we were trying to win a local race. And they were not saying, hey, you know, good luck to you on a local level. <laughs> they were doing everything they could to undermine. And they weren't doing it on substance. They weren't doing it because of the positions that I took. They were doing it strictly on partisan grounds. And despite all of those efforts, at the end of the day, uh, the evidence is that uh, I won the vote among Democrats in San Francisco. The only reason my opponent was elected was ultimately that the Republicans favored him by a margin of 80% to 20%. Um, it was um, a campaign that brought out a lot of good issues. And at the time that I had gotten into it, um, I was very fearful that uh, Gavin Newsom, who's now the mayor, was essentially going to walk into office with just a coronation, that there was no uh, strong opposition, there wasn't anyone articulating progressive ideas, and this was someone who had made a name for himself by essentially attacking the poor, uh, supporting corporate interests, and that sort of thing. I think post-election, uh, after you know running the campaign that he had to run, uh, outspending us by the margins that he outspent us by, it really changes the kind of mayor that he is and the kind of mayor that he will be for the next four years. I think one of those changes has been his position on gay marriage, which, quite honestly, in San Francisco is not a controversial issue. What, we, what, what, what those of us in the know found very amusing was that, you know, during the mayor's race, the issue came up one time, and the only candidate that expressed any ambiguity on the issue and would not commit on the issue is Mayor Newsom, or was Mayor Newsom. And of course, uh, we're delighted that he's taken the position that he has and we're there to try to fight this battle with him. But it's, it's worth saying, or at least uh, feeling a certain degree of um, being somewhat proud over the fact that we help create a condition where somebody has to move to the left to try to take away or try to, you know, shore up their support for a future election. And if that's what it is that we accomplish, I, I want to say there were a couple of things that did uh, distress me about this campaign as I reflect on it. And I think that we should all be very concerned about uh, being in a democracy where, you know, frankly, we sit around and say, well, if this candidate for mayor had had a million more dollars, he would have won. Uh, there's something just kind of ugly about that. And I think that it really, um, if anything, underscores the need for real public financing of campaigns. And uh, I, I don't think it's accidental that the efforts at creating you know, clean elections throughout this country are often undermined by the parties that have you know, very safe majorities. And I think one of the states, if I'm not mistaken, that passed a clean election law, I think it was Massachusetts, um, you know, that law was repealed by a legislature 
with a voice vote in a legislature that has a majority of Democrats in it. And I say that because I just think there's a real problem there. And I think that that is related to a crisis in our democracy as it relates to the whole idea of a Green Party candidate for president spoiling an election. And I spoke about this last night, and I want to say a few things about it because um, I, I, I hate to see how this whole issue resonates with the American public. There is this idea that Nader cost the election, and I'm willing to concede that. That's right, Nader cost the election for Gore in Florida. But what nobody wants to talk about is what the Democrats have done or not done about that problem for the last three years. That's right. And, you know, the distressing thing is that the Democrats haven't taken the steps that they need to take in order to change a really 19th century method of voting, which is that you can win all the electoral votes in a state without getting a majority of the votes there. Now, I don't know, but if you're sitting around trying to come up with a solution to this problem that cost a party the presidency, you would think that the solution that we would come to would not be to tell a third party or to tell an entire, you know, thousands of people that they can't vote for the candidate they prefer. The solution ought to be, well, let's make it so that you can't win all the votes in Florida without winning a majority. And so, because that solution is so simple, it makes you reflect on why that hasn't been a priority for the Democrats. Yeah. And I think that that's because the Democrats have benefited from the spoiler effect. They benefited in 1992 when Ross Perot won 19% of the vote. Exit polling showed that three quarters of that, if not more, of his votes would have gone to George Bush Sr. And Bill Clinton won the presidency with 43% of the vote. And that is why the Democrats have not spent three years trying to fix this problem. Now, I think that uh, you know, I want George Bush out of the White House, um, but I don't want the solution to be, um, you know, to raise a problem that I'm going to have to confront every four years. Because four years from now, uh, if, you know, John Kerry is the president and there's a Republican running against him, everybody's going to tell me I can't vote for the Green that time either because the Republican is so bad and remember George Bush. I mean, at some point, I want the Democratic leadership to step up and tell me, under their correction, th their theory on how to fix a spoiler problem, I want them to tell me when I get to vote for the candidate I want to vote for. That's right. I mean, and, I, and I want intelligent people in this country, to, when they get, when they, you know, are being told by commentators and political scientists that, oh my God, Ralph Nader's in the race, he's going to spoil the election, or Kent Mesplay, or David Cobb, or Lorna Saltzman, or these people, what are they thinking? They're giving the election to Bush. I want them to really have an intelligent dialogue and, and call it for what it is. You know, why haven't the other parties fixed this problem? They've been in control of Congress for the entire 20th century. Clearly, this is a problem that we can fix. Um, I want to just uh, say that in California, we've had some great successes, and we continue to, to fight a lot of battles. We've had mayors in many cities, including Santa Monica, where Mike Feinstein was mayor. We've had mayors in Menlo Park, in Santa Cruz, in Sebastopol, in Arcata. We've had green majorities on city councils in Arcata, I believe, in Sebastopol, and I think we had a school board majority in one of those cities. Clearly what we're learning is that you know communities that elect Greens are pleased with what they get and they return Greens to office by a very high percentage and I think that you know the Green Party isn't going to go away uh, quietly or, or anytime soon and that is because um, the type of political engagement that the Democrats have been involved in is really unsatisfactory. I mean, it leaves us wanting something. It's not okay to support the Patriot Act overwhelmingly, and even the progressive darlings of the Democratic Party like Wellstone and Boxer 
you know, to allow them to vote for the Patriot Act, it, it, that's not okay. And it's not okay when we know that there are better ideas out there and progressive ideas that can be implemented today. And we want elected officials to stand up and fight against, you know, these oppressive pieces of legislation. And, you know, I want to, you know, give props to Barbara Lee and others that stand up and every now and then fight against something, and Russ Feingold, who voted against the Patriot Act. But, uh, you know, I think it ought to resonate with people that these are a, a very big minority of folks in the United States Congress that are doing this. And it is such a minority of people um, that it makes you, you wonder where the future is for us. If the democratic approach of saying, well, we've got to vote for the Patriot Act now because, you know, the Republicans are just too strong and we'll fight them later. I mean, if that was working, well, that'd be great. But it's not working. That's not a strategy that's working. And so I don't want to reward that kind of um, weakness. And I can tell you from my experience in San Francisco, you'd be surprised that, you know, you can go and have a battle over the issues and really try to educate folks on the issues. And that's the responsibility you have if you are in government. The responsibility is not that you sign on to a piece of legislation that hasn't been publicly vetted and, and passed one of the most oppressive, you know, statutes in our country's history in, a, in less than a month period because you're scared to be identified a certain way. Um, and, and so, you know, I think as Greens, those of us who are here, we want something different. We can envision a society that we want. We want to get to live in it. You know, I'm 38 years old. I don't want this for my, you know, children and their children and their children. I want it for myself. And, you know, I'm intelligent enough to know that it's a conceivable and it's practical and it can be implemented. And so, you know, for the Democrats that are here and those that work with Democrats, you know, you have a responsibility to really put them on their heels and say, listen, what are you doing to fix this problem? And, you know, let's, uh, let's move in that direction. So, thank you so much for having me. The one thing I like about IRV um, quite a bit is that one of the reasons a political machine is able to survive is that once there is a runoff. All of the candidates that were running against the machine and running against the front runner, uh, in this case Gavin Newsom, all those candidates get an opportunity to come back into the fold. The deals get cut and suddenly all these people who were saying things about him that I would never say, uh, they were just making him out to be the worst human being out there suddenly are standing next to him, endorsing him, letting everybody know he's the best candidate in the race. And that can't happen with IRV because if you have to reveal to your supporters at that moment that you're running that, you know, the hack candidate is your second choice, well, that says something about who you are and you wouldn't get a lot of first place votes. <laughs> if, if we had more people like him and you that were, were truly warm people from the heart, I, I think we could build movements quicker because a lot of people who do politics for I don't know why seem to be a little cold and it turns a lot of people off. I often am criticized because I'm um, more of the cold variety that you're that you're describing. I think politics is very hard and I think that candidates that step forward, I'm sure uh, Congressman Conyers can tell you this, um, th there is a lot of public scrutiny on somebody and there are times when, and the, the other elected officials here can tell you this, there are times when you're just not in very good, good shape, very good form. When, you, when somebody comes up to you and you're in the coffee shop and you're tired and you just want a cup of coffee and they want to engage with you and they walk away feeling that, boy, you weren't really interested in listening to what they had to say. And it's, it's, a, tough, it's a tough job. It's also extremely difficult being in a position where other people are asking you for things all the time. Mm -hmm. And I think some people have personalities that really like that kind of sense of power, but I think it does a very negative thing to the human being in that position. I think that it's, um, 
you know, it, it, it's, it's something that needs to be resisted to a certain extent because uh, it really does separate you away from the activists and the folks that are trying to get things that they're entitled to, you know. I, I think the progressives in Congress are really doing great, you know, some great stuff. But if, if they really want to get on the front page and promote their ideas, it would be great to see the Progressive Caucus en masse register green. Oh, yeah. 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 Let me say this. What does that mean now? Register, well, register here, green. Join, join green. Now, many of them, let's, let's take the worst case scenario. Many of them, let's say, would be voted out of office. You know what? We are fungible. There are other progressives that can step forward and win these seats. But the, the sheer statement of what that would mean and the amount of coverage that would result from it and the sudden creation of a cornerstone of party would be the most important thing any of these people could do in their lifetime, I think. I mean, it would really Absolutely. be an incredible statement. Yeah. And how, as a party, do we inspire more effective local progressive candidacies to hold Democrats' feet to the fire <coughs> and to shift the political structure? Well, I, I, I raise that point uh, rather sarcastically just because I was also trying to say that the de Democrat is, Democrats want it all ways. They sort of don't want us to run nationally because they want us to run locally, but when we run locally, they're there to try to stop us and, you know, they bring in national figures to undermine us. Um, in San Francisco, what I've done is I've spent a considerable amount of effort uh, recruiting candidates to run for uh, positions. Uh, we had a very, uh, our first victory citywide. I was elected in one of the 11 districts, but citywide we won a school board race I guess now, over a year ago, two years ago, uh, Sarah Lipson won as a Green. It was our first Green victory uh, like that. And to get there, you have to field good candidates. One of the candidates we fielded in that race, Whitney Lay, African-American, you know, very talented guy, didn't get elected. Uh, we had a municipal utility district race uh, for a district that ultimately was not created, but we fielded, I think, two or three of the best candidates and they did quite well in those races. And so uh, we're committed to, to recruiting and running in the, in the small races. The problem we have is the problem of activist disengagement from electoral politics. So you can go to the march to City Hall and protest the war, and you'll see a sea of a thousand, you know, thousands of people, tens of thousands of people. But, um, you know, the thing I say is, you know, can I get a hundred of them to walk precincts in a school board race? That's what I need to build uh, to, to build a party. One of the ways that Greens are generally um, trivialized when they get into a political race is that they haven't held political office. And so you can't vote for someone because how can you entrust them when they haven't exercised political power? Um, in my case, running for mayor as the president of the Board of Supervisors, nobody could say that about me. It didn't resonate, it just wasn't true, it didn't work. So usually the knockout blow was not available to the Democrats. And um, getting people on the school board means that Sarah Lipson is gonna be you know, a front runner and formidable candidate when she ends up running for the city council, uh, the Board of Supervisors. I mean, and that's what it's gonna take, and that's what we're trying to do. And, and, um, yeah. How did you become president of the Board of Supervisors? Oh boy. Um, I, I, um, the um, race is just within the 11 members. Uh, it's a... Go back to the PD, right? No. It's a good story. Yeah. The, um, that, wasn't, that wasn't the question. There are nine Democrats <laughs> out of the 11. There's only, I'm the only Green, and there's a declined state independent who is considered the most conservative member of the council. Um, a majority of Democrats voted against me, five out of the nine, but because I had the most conservative member with me, I won in a six to five vote, essentially. And I think that that has uh, resonated in some of the more conservative communities in San Francisco because they have a sense of, you know, I may be extremely progressive and they may disagree with me on many of my ideas, but there is a sort of uh, disinclination and refusal to abuse political process to get my little advantage and win something 
at the expense of a expense of a more open, transparent process. And so, I think that's been important that the green president has uh, performed in that way and, and won the confidence of some very conservative people. Yeah. Can you talk more about how you go about recruiting candidates? Yeah. Um, I think that it is a combination of finding people that want to run and finding people who have a good personality to run and will withstand public scrutiny, but also people that are comfortable with other people and care about ideas and want to engage. I think it's less important sort of what somebody does for a living and that sort of thing, and more important that they're good at what they do. You know, I mean, if you are a landscape whatever, doing work in your lawns or whatever, if you're good at it, that's more important than anything else. You don't have to be a lawyer to run. You don't have to be a certain, you know, typical category. That's what I have found. Um, uh, for school board races, it's obviously extremely helpful to be a school teacher because the ballot designation is how most uninformed voters will vote. And that's why we think Sarah was elected uh, to that seat. Yeah. The, um, you know, in San Francisco, and I'm glad you asked that because I wanted to say that the sort of left-right of the political spectrum I don't think is the way it's perceived on a national level. Our, you know, determinations of things like gay marriage or the Patriot Act or the death penalty, these sorts of things, are, are not really widely disputed in San Francisco. Um, the left-right of the spectrum is about, um, you know, taxation. It's about class differences. It's about where you're going to prioritize city money. And it's on that spectrum that a mayor like Newsom and a representative like Pelosi, uh, you know, earn criticism because they ultimately are working for many of the downtown interests that are trying to stop a more progressive agenda uh, that, 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 that progressives in the Green Party, et cetera, want to implement. Um, I think she uh, what, lacked courage when she voted for the Patriot Act. I think it was wrong for her to vote whatever that support to troop resolution was. It kind of gave, uh, had some very strong language supporting the commander in chief. Um, you know, leadership brings responsibilities. And it's not okay to say, oh, I'm the leader, I gotta go with everybody else. No, you're the leader to not go with everybody else. They're supposed to follow you. If you're gonna... And if you're gonna raise a ton of money, you know, and prop up other Democrats, well then, you should be able to get those Democrats to follow you, you know, when it really counts. And those are votes that really count, I think. Yeah. Yeah, Matt, uh, following on the question about the Board of Supervisors, I was wondering what the impact of the mayoral election has been. How, how's the, has there been fallout, good or bad or both? Uh, and what have you found about for your agenda, for a progressive agenda, your strong run for mayor? What's the effect been in your work in the city council? I think that, that there has been some fallout. Uh, mayor Newsom recently took the gay marriage issue and uh, promoted it in a mail piece, a hit piece against the Democratic County Central Committee members who had supported me instead of him. And so he presented to the voters this idea that he's fighting this important civil rights battle. He needs Democrats that support Democrats. And uh, he targeted the ones that don't support Democrats. The suggestion was heavy that they were supporting Republicans. He didn't say, hey, these are the ones that supported Matt Gonzalez. Fortunately, they were able to survive the hits and they were re-elected. So I think it was an early test that he does not have the coattails that uh, some feared he might have, particularly on a popular issue like that. Uh, for myself on the Board of Supervisors, I've been trying to resist what often happens after a political race where you're suddenly the, the front of you know, this emerging progressive movement in San Francisco or wherever it is, I, I've been resisting being seen as like the leader of the left in that town. There really are others in that city that have, um, you know, done great progressive work and continue to do that work. So I prefer kind of the decentralized approach. Uh, and I have um, 
try to communicate in more subtle ways that, you know, this isn't going to be a Newsom versus Gonzalez thing forever, you know, that uh, there are others, Tom Amiano, Chris Daly, Jeff Adachi, you know, who are out there doing important stuff and, you know. And I think it's important that you have a, a wider net of leadership because, as I was saying, I think to Kevin and Linda last night, you know, a lot of people see what happened in San Francisco as this sort of sleeping giant awakening, this progressive movement awakening. You know, Jim and I were talking about the kind of opposite of that. We really woke up the sleeping giant of our opposition, and they got really freaked out by the fact that we got so close to winning when they were outspending us by the amount of money that they were, that they had. I mean, they're not into what happened, and they got, <laughs> they got their eyes on us now, and so we need other people out there who are crafty, doing good left work, because if they want to stay focused on me, maybe they'll give less attention to these other people. Matt, um, I'm wondering, have you endorsed the presidential candidate yet, and if not, are you going to endorse the presidential candidate? You know, in the Democratic primary, I endorsed Kucinich. That was primarily a message to decline to states who uh, can vote in some of those Democratic primaries. When I was asked whether or not I thought Greens should register Democrat to vote for him, I said no. Uh, and I have not endorsed anyone in the Green uh, primary. I do think that the Greens should field a candidate. Uh, and I'm open to... Um, not having a candidate if we see real concrete movement from the Democrats on these issues that I spoke about earlier, but I don't, knowing what I know about that party, we're not going to see that because they're going to, they're basically counting on the Greens to eventually fold our cards and run some safe state strategy or not run because Bush is so terrible. And while I agree that Bush is terrible, we really need something more than that. Otherwise, like I said, we're, we got the same problem every four years. Let me, let me say this. I mean, one thing that I actually believe and I think is effective is uh, during my mayoral race, I tried to say that um, it is not true that the Greens are left of the Democrats. And, you know, I said, listen, on social issues like the death penalty, the, the gay marriage issue, etc., it's true. We are to the left of the Democrats. But on fiscal issues, on our commitment to things like renewable energy and uh, good government uh, budgeting, etc., uh, we're not to the left of the Democrats. We are forming new relationships, and we are, you know, a good government party. And we have many, what I would say, are uh, often uh, related as Republican values in the positions that we take. And that's why having a chance to govern is so important. You know, Mike Feinstein, who spoke earlier, really didn't, I mean, he, he wasn't speaking so much about what he's accomplished in Santa Monica, but I can tell you that it was very helpful for me that when I was running for mayor and there were some stories written about what's up with this idea of having this crazy lefty guy be mayor, and they went to go look at the other crazy lefty guy who actually was mayor, and they said, gee, you know, the truth is, these guys are able to govern, and they govern in a progressive way, and they're just maybe better uh, at getting, uh, you know, in, in the planning context, certain mitigations before they allow development. And those mitigations might be more affordable housing. It might be contributions to transportation systems. It might be green building standards in the private sector. This is important stuff. And, and uh, I just think pitching the Green Party in that way at least can allow some of the Republicans who are very turned off by even George Bush's lack of fiscal accountability, you know, to start looking elsewhere, perhaps. I think Nader's really one of the progressive giants of, you know, the, the, certainly the 20th century, and he's continued to do important work recently. Um, I've had a lot of misgivings about him being a candidate uh, in the Green Party, and my concern being the possibility that the party gets overly identified with just one person. Um, and I'm, I'm concerned that, you know, if the party's going to make it, it has to 
evolve from that. On the other hand, I hear loud and clear that this is a guy with incredible progressive credentials who really is qualified to speak at a level that many cannot speak at and that uh, perhaps, you know, our party is not uh, necessarily mature enough to field these, you know, uh, presidential candidates, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, right now, I'm leaning in the direction that we should have our own candidate and we should run. And uh, I welcome Nader into a race as an independent. But, um, you know, I'm, I'm looking forward to hearing what the progressive community thinks about that.